Welcome to the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Rosensweet, mom of three young people, peaceful parenting coach, and your cheerleader and guide on all things parenting. Each week, we'll cover the tools, strategies, and support you need to end the yelling and power struggles and encourage your kids to listen and cooperate so that you can enjoy your family time. I'm happy to say we have a great relationship with our three kids. The teen years have been easy and joyful, not because we're special unicorns, but because my kids were raised with peaceful parenting. I've also helped so many parents just like you stop struggling and enjoy their kids again. I'm excited to be here with you today and bring you the insight and information you need to make your parenting journey a little more peaceful. Let's dive into this week's conversation. Hey everyone, today's episode is a guest coaching episode with Yael. You may remember Yael from a few years ago. She was on the podcast before and she's back talking about her complex kiddo, Rowan, and trying to find a way for him to feel supported at school when he's been struggling at school. And so she really wanted to, you know, school I think had just started the day before when we first spoke. And so we just talked about some strategies for her to support herself and for her to talk to the teachers and talk to Rowan himself about school and his experience at school because he had not had an easy year the year before. And so you'll hear us talking about some different ideas. And then if you stick around to the end, you will hear her update on how things went with him. And as usual, if you love the show, if you're one of our dedicated listeners, please, please share this with a friend as the best way that we can reach more people and support more families and children. And as you hear me say, change the world one family at a time. So share this episode with a friend, share it on social. And also if you could rate and review the show, that also helps us get found more easily in the podcast feed. So on Spotify or Apple, if you could rate us and leave us a review on Apple, that would be amazing. I would super appreciate it. So let's meet Yael. Hey Yael, welcome back to the podcast. Hi Sarah, thanks for having me again. So for... Yeah, for our longtime listeners might remember that you were on the podcast. I think you were my second coaching person when I first started the podcast over two years ago now. So it'd be really interesting to hear. I'm going to ask you for an update on the things we talked about two years ago. And also, you know, I think it's great to have you back because as we were saying before we started recording, you have one of those kids who are... I call them more or extra or complex kids or more challenging kids. And I had a debate in our community about the word challenging, and I didn't realize how many parents saw that as a negative word. But whatever we call it, you have one of those kids that even if you're following all the peaceful parenting things, as he grows up and his brain matures, you're going to see you know, some settling down and calming down. But you have one of those kids that's always going to be a little bit harder than the average child. Mm-hmm. Yes, I see that now already. Yeah, yeah, that you see some smoothing out as he's gotten older. Well, or just different different facets coming forward and that yeah. there are going to be different things at different periods, but I think it's never going to be relaxing. Yes. But it's yes. always going to be interesting. <laughs> For sure. I always say like those that the those those these kids that are more complex or challenging or more extra are definitely like more interesting than the average child. (laughs) Okay. So why don't we back up a little bit and just explain, you can say who you are and yeah, welcome back. Thank you. Sure. My name's Yael and I am a mom in a two mom family. We live in Norway, which means our context is somewhat different for child rearing. And we have an eight, almost nine-year-old named Rowan and a four-year-old named Ilana. Uh, Rowan is just starting fourth grade, although I think in North America, he would be starting third. Yeah. Great. So I know today we are going to talk a little bit about the beginning of school and some challenges that you are having or that you're worried about having with Rowan in school. But let's get an update on, you said when before we started recording, you couldn't really remember what we talked about. So this is going to be super fresh. So the two things that I remember us talking about in that episode that you were on before were that you were frustrated and how much support you had to give Rowan in getting ready and in the morning, especially like getting dressed and getting himself ready for school and that you were frustrated and how much support he needed at bedtime. And I had coached you on thinking of that support as a gift and as connection. And just because he, you think he, he could do it and should do it doesn't mean that he's 
necessarily capable of doing all of that stuff without your support. So how did how did those things shift and where are you today with those things? Hmm. It's funny that you say that because one of the things we were talking about this summer at one point, my wife and I, was that Rowan used to say, you know, why she might have said to him like, oh, Rowan, like, why don't you dress to yourself? And he said, why should I waste my time on that? I remember that. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, no, it's interesting. So he still needs quite a bit of support. But actually, just this past week or so, I made a chart for him of like steps of things to do in the morning that he can sort of and laminated it so he can mark it off. And he has been using it for about a week. And that's going so well that he said to me the other day, but why don't we have one for bedtime? So then I also made one for bedtime. So now I need to remind him to look at his chart and carry it with him around the house. He still needs reminders for that, but he's actually doing a lot better, at least at first with the novelty of it. You know, he really likes novel things. So it's working right now. I don't know if in a month or two it will still be working. So that's interesting that this was an issue last time we talked because I just found a very new strategy for us. What was it? So was he still, he was still needing a lot of support before you made the chart? He was, he would just be kind of dreamy. So, you know, if you said, okay, you know, now you've had breakfast upstairs in our house, the kitchen, living room or upstairs, and you can go downstairs and like finish getting dressed, brush your teeth, put on your shoes, and he'd come down and he'd be like playing Legos or right. I think, yeah. So you mentioned that you're in the, that you're in the process of getting assessed and that he's twice exceptional. Maybe tell us a little bit about where you are on that journey. Cause you didn't say what you were looking at, but that sounds like a kid with ADHD to me. Yes. So, I mean, he, well, there's a lot I could say, but basically he was assessed by a neuropsychologist in the spring and they are not allowed, anyway, it's hard to explain, but in Norway, they're not allowed to set an ADHD diagnosis because only the National Health Service is allowed to do that. And now we have an appointment with them in September. But what the findings from the testing showed was that on sort of the the IQ test, the WISC-5, he was in the 96th percentile. So what you might in North America call gifted and in sort of all the different kind of assessments that had to do with impulsivity and attention and focus, he was between the second and fifth percentile, Mm -hmm. which is really low. Really low. So, <laughs> so yeah. he's on the tail ends. And so that means, yes, that he is very likely ADHD combined type. Right. And there might be other things in there emotional. I mean, I sometimes suspect maybe some anxiety, but that's not something that those assessments they did would have picked mm-hmm. up on. So twice exceptional for people who don't know that term, also called 2E is gifted, gifted, a gifted diagnosis is not the right word, designation that goes along with some other form of neurodivergence or learning disabilities. And it's very common for gifted kids. What they say is gifted doesn't usually travel alone. And that often with gifted kids, there are other, other things that come along with that. And so that's great that you're getting, that you're getting that assessment because it does the, the, just the, you know, I tell him to go and do these three things, then I come and find him playing Lego. It's very, it's a very ADHD thing, right? Mm-hmm. And probably your four-year-old can go and do the things that you ask her to do. Right. Yes. I mean, she and has always from the beginning, like she'll wake up in the morning and dress herself and then yeah. come into our bedroom and be like, hi, I got dressed. Yeah. 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 Different, different neurotypes for sure. Okay. So let's talk about your current challenges. What's going on? Mm -hmm. So the biggest challenge is that by the end of last school year, sort of in the spring, Rowan had basically for the last few months sort of opted out of participating in pretty much any learning activities at school. So some days on a good day, he might take his encyclopedia out and sit under his desk and read while kids were doing other things. Or on a bad day, he might be like throwing pencils or, and the school's response to this, I think was not 
super sophisticated. Like often they would just have him sit in a different little room, maybe with an aide if there was one available or by himself or go down to where the principal's office is with his work to work there. So basically my sister-in-law, who's a cognitive neuropsychologist, was like, pshaw, they're just making life easier for the teacher. They're not really supporting him when they do that. And I'm not saying they haven't tried. I think they've tried different things, but I don't think they've had really the tools to support him in a good way. And and so, I mean, he's missed a lot of learning and obviously has just had a terrible experience and feels like he's being sent to prison every day. So it hasn't really been fun. And I've had a lot of meetings with the school. And then we had this assessment done, like I mentioned. And also this summer we were in Toronto, where I'm from and where my mother lives. And I had an assessment with an occupational therapist because occupational therapists in North America do a lot of support for kids with ADHD and executive function. But in Norway, that's not not really an ordinary part of that profession. And she had a lot of helpful suggestions as well. So now we're back and what were just oh, just stop for a second. What what kind of suggestions did she have? Well, one thing that she said was that he has low muscle tone, which makes it harder for him to sit for a long time and harder to hold a pencil and write for a long time and that he'll fatigue faster than other kids. So some of the kind of behavior is not only related to ADHD, but also can be related to just physical limitations that can be strengthened. But that was really news to us and was very reassuring because first, okay, I don't have a bad kid, you know, and also, I mean, I know he's not a bad kid, but I feel like I was getting so many messages about behavior from school. Um, And also she had a lot of suggestions around supporting executive function and also a lot of physical accommodations at school that we can do. And so a lot of the physical accommodations we've gotten the school to support now, I mean, such as day two of school. So But like sitting on a wiggle cushion, which I bought while we were in North America and having an elastic, a stretchy elastic around the legs of his chair so he can bounce his feet and having a visual timer on his desk so that if they say, okay, we're just going to do this for 20 minutes, he can move it over to 20 minutes and see in red the time counting down because apparently a lot of people with ADHD don't manage to keep track of time very well. Ta- so if time doing, blindness, it's called. Yeah, <laughs> if they're doing something boring, it feels to the kid like they're going to be doing it forever because mm-hmm. you know, they're just really in the present moment. So that's something that OT explained to us. So we have all these kinds of tools, but I think that they may help and they may help a lot, but I think there's like so it's such a much bigger picture than just you know, there's a whole emotional component and the kind of negative experiences that he's had at school. Yeah, I want to back up what you said. I'll back up to what you said about he's, you know, he's not a bad kid. I think that's Mm -hmm. a really helpful part of getting an assessment is because I think if, you know, the adults in a kid's life don't understand the challenges that they're experiencing, they do just see that as a bad Mm -hmm. kid, right? This kid won't listen. He won't pay attention. He won't You know, he won't do what we're asking him to do. But I think when you understand what you're, I'm just going to say what you're up against in terms Mm -hmm. like those low, you know, the two to five percent percentile of attention and focus, Mm -hmm. he's doing the best he can, which is what we always say in peaceful parenting, right? So in peaceful parenting, we talk about the gap between expectations and reality, right? And that, that often frustrating space in between what's happening and what you want to be happening. And I love that you've got these, you know, new ideas that hopefully like the physical supports that you're talking about that hopefully will help. And also I can't stress enough how important it is to hopefully, I want to ask you have, how much have you talked to the teacher, you know, that support understanding that he is doing the best he can from the adults in his life will go a long way to helping him feel good about himself. Right. Because a lot of kids with ADHD end up with really negative self-worth because they're corrected so much. Like, I don't remember the number I heard, but it was like 12 times as much as the average child or something like that, that they re- received like negative corrections. Mm-hmm. And I could have just made up that number, but it's a lot more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so it can really affect their self-worth and, and it's how they see themselves. So so what do you, what's your sense on the teacher that he has this year? 
Well, so they, it's interesting because in the Norwegian system, they have a teacher that usually follows them all the way until maybe fourth or fifth grade. And then the teacher loops back and takes a new group of first graders. Um, but one of the things that we have done is, and I feel really fortunate that we were able to make this work, is he switched teachers now. So there's like a new, one of the teachers looped back and there's a new teacher. And so he is now in the group with the new teacher. Although in terms of his day-to-day experience of school, I don't think it makes much difference because they do a lot of rotation. So all the kids work with all the four teachers in the grade. But in terms of having that sort of person who's his main contact to like talk to him if there are issues, talk to the family, you know, it's a different teacher. And I think that'll be good because even though in many ways I really liked the teacher he had before, I felt like by the end she was so worn out by him. Mm -hmm. That like she only could see deficits, you know, Mm -hmm. and I feel like every time we talked with the school, we would just hear about behavior and behavior and behavior. And even when we brought them the results from that assessment, the teacher said, and I had also gotten some advice from someone who has a project with gifted kids in our city. There's no, Norway doesn't acknowledge or recognize giftedness in the education system. So there's huh. no accommodations for giftedness. So I was, I'm concerned and still concerned that they're going to try to do accommodations for ADHD, but without also giving him sort of interesting and challenging things to do that he's engaged with, it's not going to help. Because things that he considers boring, I mean, we have to help him learn to tolerate boredom. You know, that's part of our job. But but still, that it'll be so hard for him to get engaged with things if it's just lots of worksheets. So we'll see what happens. But anyway, what I was going to say about the teacher is that she almost like couldn't recognize that the gifted side was there. And one of the pieces of advice we had gotten was to tell the school not to worry too much if he has some holes in foundational skills, because gifted kids often can go back and kind of fill those holes later. Mm -hmm. And when I said that to the teacher and the sort of section head, the teacher said, oh, yes, I'm very worried about the holes that he has. You know, it's like kind of not able to think out of the box. Yeah. Right. Clearly the teacher doesn't have ADHD. She can't think out of the box. Yeah. Rowan can. Um, So, I mean, is there any level at which you can just say, you know, thank you for your concern and we'll take responsibility for whatever, you know, learning holes he has? Maybe. I mean, my hope is that with this new teacher that we'll be able to like shift things a little bit. And I think we'll see because what they kept saying to Rowan, he would ask for harder work and they would say, well, do this first and show us what you're able to do. And then if you're, when you're done with this, we'll give you the, you know, the fourth grade worksheet when they were in third grade. But, but he was never able to actually do the third grade worksheet because he couldn't keep his attention on it because mm-hmm. he was bored by it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I feel very skeptical about whether the school is actually going to be able to and interested in and willing to do any kind of pedagogical changes, you know? like there, they, mm. I mean, I know this is a, a very specific thing that you just said in terms of like the, doing the worksheet to show that he can do it. One thing that helps a lot with gifted kids who – I, I have a I have a couple of two e kid I have, I have one two e kid myself who's now grown mm-hmm. up, but I used to scribe for him because he like just meaning like write down the things like you know he'd look at it and say what the answer was and I'd write it down and we just go through it super quick. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that's something you could do at home, like mm-hmm. if there are things that he needs to show that he can do. If there's any way that you could do do it with him, if he could bring it home and do it with him, and then bring it back and say yeah he knows how to do this. I don't know if that's something that might help. Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting idea. I mean, we've done that a little bit this summer. I was trying a little bit to nudge him to do some extra math with me in the summer just because he had missed so much math by not participating in class and just walking out of the classroom and hanging out in the hallway. (laughs) But And I got him to do some, not as much as I had hoped, but the way I was able to involve him in actually doing the math was I said, I'll write it. You just tell me the answer. Yeah. That no, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe if that keeps coming up, then we can mm-hmm. try that as a strategy. Mm-hmm. Or even an aide could do that. I mean, that's actually like an educational technique to scribe for kids who have a hard time focusing on it. Mm-hmm. So something you could mention to them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll try that. And I think like when it comes to our conversation, I mean, 
one thing is actually how to talk to the school and get them on board and get them to see that kids do well when they can, because I think they don't really have that view, which is sad. <laughs> but mm-hmm. it's that I just feel so resentful <laughs> of how they have handled the situation till now. And it has escalated so much that he's developed like such a strong negative feeling about school, you know, and like early on when things were just starting to escalate, the teacher said to me, yeah, I asked him like, well, why Rowan, why are you doing whatever, you know? And he said, I don't know. I don't know. I just feel stressed. And she said, and I said to him, stress, hmm, well, you're clearly feeling something, but it can't be stress because there's nothing stressful about this ordinary learning situation. Oh, no. (laughs) I know. And I just feel like, oh my gosh, I don't know. Yes. So, and this is your only option for school? We have looked at another school and the there are not a lot of private school. We could move to another public school potentially. I don't necessarily think it would be particularly different. No. But there are a few options for private school. And the one that I think would be the best fit is the international school. Mm-hmm. But it's logistically really challenging for us to mm-hmm. move in there. It's like far away in the other opposite direction from where he'd have to take public bus alone. I mean, he can take the public bus alone, but it would be adding a lot of commuting time to his day, a lot of logistics, and it's also expensive. So we kind of have decided right now that we'll give the public school a try for two months right now and see. My wife also just started a new job this week. And so there's just a lot of change. Yeah, Yeah. it was a bit hard to decide to actually like up, you know, this huge upheaval also with the new school and the new commute and everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's an option. They do. Sorry, I just was going to say that they use the international baccalaureate curriculum, which is uh, very challenging based and like the student agency at the center. And they work with these units where the teacher will say to the class, yeah, what do you want to know about this topic? And I think Rowan would really like that, but they don't Mm -hmm. have any, they don't have the right to special ed supports from the state, right? Mm Because it's a private school. So, you know, depending on what kinds of supports Rowan ends up needing, for the ADHD side, I feel like the gifted side would be served really well by that school. Right. But the ADHD side, who knows? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess that's in your back pocket if you need it. You can always Mm -hmm. check it out. So how can I support you? When I was thinking about that coming to this conversation, one of the things I was thinking is I'm not sure exactly what to ask Sarah for, but what I know is that I keep talking about this with everybody that I encounter. (laughs) And so it's like clearly something that I'm not able to sort of chill out about or not be really worried about kind of all the time. And so I feel like it might be helpful to sort of think through or help me separate out like, you know, what is my responsibility? What is Rowan's responsibility? You know, how to like help the school support Rowan, how to make a family decision about like when it's time to pull out and, you know, I I don't Mm -hmm. know, just this kind of it sounds also, I mean, you sound really anxious about it. And I mean, and, and I'm not saying you that I that you shouldn't be anxious mm. about it, but maybe we could talk about some ways you could coach yourself to be able to – because I think right now you're like super granularly focused mm-hmm. on these day-to-day, but like maybe trying to think about this, the, like the bigger picture mm-hmm. and resilience and that it's not always going to be this hard might be might make things feel a little bit easier. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe just telling yourself how, you know, I think that that whatever happens, you can handle it and he can handle it and that you're going to figure this out and you're going to get through it. Like just some, I don't know, some some comforting word of strength for yourself when you start to feel like really nervous and anxious about it. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, like a mantra. Mm-hmm. Mm. I don't know. What would resonate for you, do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think in my sort of worst worry moments, then I think, oh my gosh, he's just going to end up, I don't know, <laughs> and ending up in a group of kids that, you know, are basically a sort of at-risk group that sort of just hang out, don't participate, don't engage, do drugs, you know. As my my friend Ned Johnson, who wrote the Self Driven Child, he says the the fear is he'll end up living in a van down by the river. Right, <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> maybe that's the fear or like commit crimes or something, you know, and I have to like really see like the, not just see the deficits too, you mm-hmm. know, and like sometimes that's hard because he can also be a real handful at home at times, although mm-hmm. he's also super sweet and super affectionate and and you asked about bedtimes early, earlier, and, you know, he still wants me to lie next to him for him to fall asleep. And now it goes fast because he takes melatonin. So that's that problem mm-hmm. is solved by just that, you know, he's still like a little like cuddly, sweet kid. So just remembering that side of him. And also, I think I also was such an academically driven kid and adult for that matter. I mean, I'm an academic. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think I've always felt like, you know, when you're a kid, what you do is school. And maybe I need to think about it a different way that there are a lot of pathways. My wife is much better at that than I am. Well, the, the I mean, the, yes, there are a lot of pathways other than academics, for sure. I mean, that's one of the big things that they talk about in the self-driven child is, you know, that's only that is only one pathway. And there are there are other things that people can do that have a really meaningful and successful life. So I think reminding yourself of that. And also, he's still only eight, almost nine. Yeah. Like one of my kids who's just about to start university, he did not get interested in academics until he was in grade 11. I mean, he always did fine, like, but he didn't like he just did the minimum and kind of just coasted, right? But it, it took until grade 11 for him to actually be interested in anything that he was learning. And so I think you could have to remind yourself that the student that Rowan is at eight, almost nine, is not, doesn't, it it doesn't mean anything about who he's going to be in a few years. Mm -hmm. And also remind yourself with ADHD, I don't know if anyone's ever told you this, but kids with ADHD are often three to four years behind developmentally in a lot of areas. So if he were only, you know, five or six, you wouldn't be like, oh my God, he's never going to do anything in school, right? Mm -hmm. And also it's like, he's really interested in a lot of things. Like one Mm -hmm. of the things the teachers say about him or his, that one teacher, his homeroom teacher that has, he's had since first grade said, so he's very knowledgeable about a lot of things, you know, and she's a little dismissive of it in a way, or maybe she's not trying to be, but it sounds like that when she says it, yes, he's very knowledgeable. Like, you know, yes, obviously in your family, you talk about a lot of stuff other families don't talk about or he reads stuff other families Mm -hmm. don't give their kids to read, you know, social things, political things about sort of sexual orientation or about social justice or whatever Mm -hmm. things he brings to the table. But yeah, so and he reads a ton. He's a big reader. So, I mean, it's not like he's not curious and interested in stuff. He obviously is. Well, and back yet, to those when it's like connected to school, it's a bit like, no, I don't like learning. Right. But back yeah. to those, like the quote, learning gaps that they were talking mm-hmm. about, those mm-hmm. are the things that he can fill in when he ne- knows that he needs to. Mm-hmm. Like the, the fact that he's a really turned on learner, even if it's not the things he's supposed to be learning, is going to carry him a, like a very, very far away. Mm-hmm. So I think the biggest thing you have to worry about, if I were you, is keeping him engaged and mm-hmm. um, feeling good about himself even if he's not fitting in the idea they have of a good student. Because it sounds like the idea they have, you remember hearing about like the research about valedictorians going on to not being the most successful people in life. Have you heard about that research? No, I That to be so. like the valedictorian of your high school, you have to be really good at a lot of things like, or, or mm-hmm. good enough at a lot of things, like everything. You have to be more of a generalist, right? Mm-hmm. To get the highest GPA in all of the subjects. But to be really successful in life, you have to have like a, a, a passion about one thing that you're really good at. And, and that might mean that the other things fall aside, right? So to be, to, to be checking all the boxes and all of these learning areas is not necessarily what's going to be setting him up for success as he grows up. Mm, That's so interesting. And I also feel like right now I'm coming off like (laughs) somebody who's really worried about their kid getting into the best college or the right college. And that's not at all where I'm at. I'm more like, how is he going to survive this without his spirit being killed and his interest Mm -hmm. in learning being killed? So, Mm -hmm. well, and I think, (laughs) yeah, no, no, no. I, 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 that's what I got from what you were saying. But I I think a lot of that is how you talk about it at home. Like, it's almost like, I'm sorry to any of the teachers out there, but it's almost like telling him that what the teachers are saying is important, is not important, you know, and just like, okay, what's important here? And I'm not saying you directly tell him it's not important what your teacher says, but just trying to balance out that, you know, are you learning? Are you having fun? And not getting caught up in the, 
you know, what's their idea of a good student. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, schools are really designed such that all kids should be the same. Mm -hmm. Totally. I mean, that's right. And that's so obviously, I don't know, I've always been interested in education as a kind of intellectual kind of thing. I'm interested in education. I work in education. And and yet now that I have my own kid, I feel like, oh my gosh, (laughs) I totally can empathize with people who just decide to pull their kids out completely and do homeschooling or unschooling. Like that's not at all an option for us. And it would just kill my soul to do it. <laughs> but, um, I tried. But- I tried and was not successful. <laughs> mm. But yeah, I had the same feelings too with my two-week kid when he was in school that it was really, uh, we, he never found, uh, not to make you f- feel bad, but he never found a fit through his entire we tried so many different things and it just, the school system just wasn't set up for kids like that. He mm-hmm. made it through and he's fine and he's good and he's just about to finish university, but it never was a place, like going through public school, there was never a place that served the needs that he had. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm in a Facebook group for 2 e kids and it's mostly American, I think, although it's got people from everywhere. But yes, so many people are in that group talking about what school can they send their kid to. Mm -hmm. So we have account systems that really meet sort of a broad set of learning needs. No. And what I, when I, I went to teacher's college and what I found was like the kids who are at either end of the continuum of needing more support, either because they, you know, had some learning challenges or more support because they, you know, needed more challenge, they fell through the cracks, right? It's really only the kids in the middle that were getting served. And you can see why if you have 30 kids in the classroom, you can't do individualized education for everyone. Um, so no shade on on teachers, um, but it's just really hard when you do have the kids who are not fitting into that mold of, of what a student should look like. Um, which reminds me, you know, just I wanted to make a comment about the ADHD brain, which is sort of what sounds like with Rowan, is that the ADHD focuses on what's interesting, not what's important. And that's what the teacher's coming up against, right? Like to the teacher, what's important is like all of these learning skills that he's supposed to have at this age. And if they're not interesting to him, he has a hard time focusing on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I have also tried to do a little bit of supplementing. Like at the end of the school year, I thought, okay, I did think a little bit like what you said, can we show the teachers what Rowan's actually capable of doing? Because I just felt so frustrated that I felt like they wouldn't believe me, you know, or Mm -hmm. like they wouldn't believe the test results almost. They were just like, oh, hmm, okay but the behavior, you know? Yeah. And and so I thought, oh, maybe I could do a project with Rowan in the summer. He's really interested in geography. And I said, what if we like made a book together, you know, like just put together, you know, about something about geography, like pick a country or pick something. And he got really ambitious, like, oh, let's do like a whole continent. <laughs> I tried to narrow him down a little. We got narrowed down. And then the first day that we were going to like, okay, what would we, let's make a mind map together. He learned how to make mind maps at school anyway. And I was like, like, I'll write it down. Like, what should we put in? And, but I don't know, we wrote like three bubbles. And then he was like, hmm, I don't think I want to do this now. Maybe another summer. <laughs> and we didn't get any further with it. So it's interesting because I think it's obviously hard to engage him at school. I can't even engage him on those kinds of activities at home when he's the one in the driver's seat. I mean, if he's the one really in the driver's seat, he wants to drive somewhere else, which is more like physical play than reading books on his own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't think you're alone in finding that. I think we learned during the pandemic that parents don't make very good teachers when they're tr- when we're trying to do like that traditional style of teaching. It just doesn't work very well. So I don't think that's you and Rowan specific. I think that, you know, most parents find that as a challenge. Maybe what we should be talking about is that how can we talk to Rowan about what he can do to have better behavior? Like I know mm-hmm. that there is a certain amount that is outside of his control because he's young and he has these challenges. However, there may be some stuff that we can talk to him about and help him see how it benefits him to, you know, listen to the teachers a little bit more. Like I always think that, that for kids, if they don't see a reason, like if they don't have intrinsic motivation to, you know, quote, be good, it's, you know, why bother? Right. But maybe we can help him find some intrinsic motivation. Like how is his life going to be easier because he has a good relationship with his teacher and can, you know, try a little bit more to do what is asked of him. 
That's interesting because I've approached this so far, like one of the things the occupational therapist suggested was using this kind of zones of regulation. Mm -hmm. So basically there's kind of four zones and none of them are bad, but some of them might be better than others at different kinds of moments and settings. Yeah. It's about, for anyone who doesn't know the zones, it's about nervous system regulation. And it's basically teaching kids to learn the signs of their own bodies of when they're feeling calm and focused and connected, or when they're starting to feel dysregulated on the dysregulated active side, or when they're starting to feel unengaged, like no energy, low energy on the unengaged side. Mm. Okay, so go go ahead. mm -hmm. No, so that he's taken to like super well. And I tried to say to him like this morning on the way to school, I was like, you know, those don't, you know, you have a lot of fidgets and you have a lot of things now at school, but part of it is also like your own feelings and noticing your feelings and like trying to help bring yourself back to the green zone, which is the one that's kind of calm and focused and ready to learn and happy. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and so that's fine, but that doesn't have anything to do with the intrinsic motivation. So I think that's Mm -hmm. a really interesting suggestion that you have, because it's one thing, but like, you know, why to be motivated himself to actually be in the green zone and get any kind of benefit or, you know, not get in trouble or you well, know, be, so I and I think the the intrinsic motivation is that his makes his life easier, mm-hmm. right? Like it's it's like when you have. I mean, this is a little bit different, but when you when you know what people expect from you, and you try to, and I'm not saying we try to turn him into a people pleaser, but it's almost that. It's almost like, but not because it's not so that he get so like people people who are people pleasers do it to feel good about themselves and get their self-worth from that and that's not what I'm talking about I'm talking about learning some of those people pleasing traits for his own self-interest to make his life easier so that he's not you know it, it's kind of like the, the person who can make everyone like them and then they get like the advances at work and raises and promotions and whatever because they're really well liked I mean there is research about that that being well liked in your office, gets you further than being good at your job right Mm -hmm. so so for his own feeling good about being at school like that's I guess that's the intrinsic intrinsic motivation that I'm thinking of Mm. and so what kind of strategies do you think would be helpful I think just talking to him about how Mm. do you how do you think your teacher feels when you're when she's uh, this is just an example like to Mm -hmm. take an take a behavior that has been challenging when you are ignoring what your teacher says or, you know, running out of the room, like trying, I guess, trying to get him to have a little perspective taking on how that would be frustrating for the teacher and how if they could work together, then, you know, maybe the teacher would then be more willing to do things that he wants. Like it's just having him see that the relationship is like a two-way street is I guess what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm kind of thinking of this spur of the moment and I hope it makes sense, but just trying to trying to help him see how his role in the relationship could either make life easier for him or life harder for him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. And then and then trying to have these kind of strategies for self-regulating yeah. so that he can actually use them, right? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. yeah. Like giving him a reason to use the strategies. Mm hmm. That's interesting. I could even ask him, you know, well, why, why would you want to use this strategy? Mm -hmm. Like, what do you think the benefit would be of being in the green zone? Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. and I, and I guess I brought up trying to see things from the teacher's point of view, because I think that sometimes kids just don't, that don't do that naturally. Like they, they want to do what they want to do and they don't see how that affects other people. Mm -hmm. I remember I was working with this client who had a a little girl in kindergarten who kept hiding every time it was time to come in for recess and it was really <laughs> stressing the teacher out. And, and, you know, she was getting labeled like behavior problem, whatever in kindergarten. Mm-hmm. And she was really strong willed. And I told the parents to, to explain to the girl, you know, you know, the teacher's responsible for keeping you safe. And if every time you hide and she doesn't know where you are, that is making her feel really stressed and like she's not doing her job. And the kid was like, Oh, like, like she had never thought about it from that point of view. And then she stopped hiding because (laughs) she saw this bigger picture. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's interesting. I think that part of the materials from those sort of zone of regulation curriculum has you do that kind of exercise with the kids where it's like, think about the behavior, whatever specific behavior, and how did that affect people around you? Mm -hmm. When you did this, and then how did they react? And then how did you react? And I haven't done that with them yet. It feels like there's so much, you know, it's hard to, yes. Well, maybe you, maybe you wait until, I mean, maybe he's had a development of maturity since last year and that it's not going to be as much of an issue. And so maybe rather than trying to like do this in, you know, before anything happens, maybe if things happen, you can start Mm -hmm. to talk to him about how do you think that made the teacher feel? How do you think that made the teacher feel about you? What's something that you could do differently next time that would have a better result for both you and the teacher? Mm -hmm. That's so helpful. I need to go back and listen to the podcast when it comes out and write that down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can send you a recording of it before mm-hmm. it, before it comes out. But yeah, I think just trying to maybe just help him zoom out and have like a bigger mm-hmm. picture. So I think that's something that you could concretely work on, helping the teachers and the school understand him and his challenges and his strengths is another thing mm-hmm. that you're already doing. And I think working on your own catastrophic you know, fear that he's going to end up living in a van down by the river <laughs> is another thing because I think mm-hmm. he is going to be fine. Like as he gets older and he's going to become more capable of doing the things that he needs to do to get through mm-hmm. school. And also he's, you know, I think keeping, keeping him engaged with all the stuff you are already doing at home too, as a learner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, it is interesting to me. The Rowan that the teachers know at the school, I think, is such a very limited version in a way of Mm -hmm. the Rowan that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because people who meet him for the first time just see like a really like bright, energetic, charming and social and friendly person who's really interested in lots of things. Well, and I think keeping that in your forefront of your vision, too. Mm-hmm. Right. And and holding that space that that's who he is and not this like, you know, quote, bad kid at school. Mm-hmm. Bad kid or like kid with lots of deficits. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And going back to what you said, what they did last year was just like pulling him out to make life easier for the teacher. Is there some way that if they continue to do that, how can you make those like, can he have his own things that he's reading or doing at those times? Like, how could you make that work for him? If he's pulled out, that he's mm-hmm. doing his own things. Because right now, I mean, the way it was last year is if he got pulled out, then he would continue, like, supposed to do the work that the rest of the class mm. was doing, but kind of do it on his own. And I think he would do it. I think it would take him a lot longer, though. And I think, you know, he sometimes would get kind of forgotten in the principal's office. One time he said to me, yeah, I just kept doing the work. And I said, can I go back now? And they said, oh, they'll come and get you. And then they didn't come and get him until, you know, then the school day was over. And oh, no. went out to aftercare, having done a lot more than what he was supposed to do, I think. Anyway, so yeah, I think it's not I mean, well, it's, I think it's when actually he's read his own encyclopedia under the desk. I don't see that as such a loss. I mean, I exactly. Like, that's okay, my point. That's yeah. okay. That's fine. Yeah. You know, if he's reading things, it's not yeah. a big deal. Or drawing um, or writing or, you know, whatever he likes to do. Yeah. It's um, interesting because I said to him once when I was in school, I mean, I guess I was older than he is now. Like I used to draw while I listened, like in the margins and like my mm-hmm. writing was all full of doodles and I said, can you do that? And he just sort of looked at me with wonder and was like, we're not allowed to do that. And I was like, really? Are they that controlling? You know, and maybe he just thinks they're not allowed to do that. And he actually could. Mm-hmm. But but I think all these kinds of strategies for sort of keeping yourself interested when things don't seem that interesting to you. Mm-hmm. Totally. If the school is not actually letting them do it, you know, then that's really limiting their capacity to find strategies. Mm hmm. Well, and, you know, also the the p- taking yourself away or getting put somewhere else is actually not a bad strategy to, for focus. So maybe you tr- start to talk about that. It's not a punishment. Just if you're like my daughter, who she's going into her second to last year of high school, she has ADHD. And one of her strategies and her teachers have told me that she's really good about saying, can I go work in the hall or can I go work in the library? Because she finds the chatty atmosphere of the classroom way too hard to focus in. So 
maybe that's just not a terrible thing depending on what the people's intent is when he when he needs that time away from the classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I think it actually started a little bit more as like, maybe you can work better in that other space. And I think he mostly agreed with that. But I think it became like, just so much of that, you know, yeah. And then is that something you can talk to the new teacher? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Like when to use that as a strategy and when not to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, hopefully you've got some things to focus on and work on and we'll catch up with you in maybe about a month and see how how things went okay great I think we'll know so much more in a month because then school will have been going for a month yeah we'll see how how it went and and in the meantime hopefully you can talk to him about you know the relationship building and w- mm-hmm. how it can help him and and hopefully the the things that OT gave you are going to help him too thank you okay we'll talk to you soon Hi, Al. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi. So tell us, school's been going for more than a month now, I think. Mm-hmm. How is Rowan doing and how is that? How are they are they supporting him like we wanted? Yeah. So, well, actually, things have been going, I would say, on the whole really well. I mean, to the point that, I mean, obviously things aren't perfect, but we are thinking, oh, okay, maybe, maybe public, public school is going to work out after all. So that's really good. And Rowan has everything all set up with their like, he has like the chair with a cushion that I talked about last time and all all these tools. And I think I tend to get a call from the teacher if there's been anything that's really disruptive that's happened that day. But I think like the most I've had is two calls in one week. And it's been more just to inform me if there's something that teacher thinks I could maybe talk about with Rowan. But most days I think I've been good. And Rowan's been telling me how his friends come up to him and say, oh, you know, come, come play with us. Like, and Rowan says, no, go away. I mean, <laughs> during class time. Oh, okay. During okay. class time. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. So whereas before he would have just run out with them. So, I mean, I think what's really, really clear is that Rowan is really trying really hard to stay in class and participate and do things. And I mean, he still tells me it's boring, but most of the time I think he manages to stay in. And uh, yeah, sometimes by the end of the day, things kind of break down a little bit, but most of the time I think things are going much better. So yeah, so so that feels very positive. And I feel like I'm a little bit too on top of him sometimes like okay how is it going how is school today how is this how is that you know and it just makes me think about well like Tasha Shore talks about not talking so much Mm -hmm. (laughs) the other thing I was talking to a client yesterday she was talking about how her daughter gets really upset when she asks her like do you have you know when you do your homework or have you done this or that for school and the dad said, we never really do have to ask her because she really is conscientious about doing her homework. And I said, maybe a good guideline would be, are you asking for yourself, for your mm-hmm. own anxiety? Or are you asking because you actually need to know something, right? And so maybe that might be a good thing for you to think about. Like, are you asking him because you're anxious and you're trying to get some answers? Or do you really need to get some information from him? Mm, that's a really good way to think about it because of course it's just for myself to know and to feel reassured that things are going fine but I mean I also am kind of trying to find are there patterns to times that things are difficult so that I can sort of support Mm -hmm. Rowan but Rowan said to me the other day I said so after like about two weeks of school I said to Rowan, oh, you've been working really hard to stay in class and participate. And I noticed that and it's like amazing and you're doing great. And are you still getting those feelings in your body that make you want to get up and run out of the classroom? And he said, yes. And I said, so what do you do when you get those feelings? And he said, I think about the consequences. And wow. I, thought, I know it, you know, and it's interesting because so on the one hand, I feel like that's really good. And on the other hand, I feel like there's something sort of fear-based and mm-hmm. like, do you know what I mean? That I worry a little bit that he's kind of 
disciplining himself harshly to like keep himself there well, but so the, it's a continuum yeah like like on one end of it is just like healthy discipline and healthy fear because i think there i think there is such a thing as healthy fear mm-hmm. of you know the wanting to do the right thing you know you want this but you want to be seen well in your teacher's eyes more or you want to mm-hmm. participate in school more versus like feeling kind of paralyzed and like shut down in a fear way Mm-hmm. Like, like there's a continuum there. And like, as long right. as he's on towards one end more than the other end, I think it's fine. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really kind of get a sense of which end he was on. But the other day I asked him, or just a few days ago, I said, you know, are you still sometimes feeling like you want to just leave the room? And what do you do? And he says, oh, I use the strategies like I had written up. I don't remember if we talked about this, but I had We had this kind of a color fan for the zones of regulation where we work together to write like what are strategies you can use when you're feeling wiggly and silly and what are strategies you can use when you're feeling angry. And we have things like different kinds of breathing and calming techniques and also asking to take a break or, you know, different kinds of things that Rowan could do. And and at first, I didn't think he was actually using them at all. But then the other day, he told me that he does use them. So that was great, exciting. So I feel and the thing that he hasn't been using as much is the time timer, the visual timer. And I'm trying to encourage him to actually remember to use it because I think that'll really help him stick with That's stuff awesome. that he has to do. But one thing that also is exciting is that yesterday, Rowan told me, and the teacher also called to ask me something and also told me that Rowan was given sixth grade level English to do instead of the fourth grade level English to do. And Rowan came home saying, oh, it was like, it was not that interesting, but it was a lot better. And it was on the computer and he had to read some texts. And then he got to answer on the computer. And he said to me, it's so much easier for me to write when it's on the computer. So I just feel like that was two really good things. And well, that could be that could be an accommodation that that going forward for him, if it's easier Mm -hmm. for him to type rather than write. Mm -hmm. It is for a lot of kids. Yeah. So I think we're going to move in that direction. And we also had last week or yeah, last week, the first meeting at the kind of National Health Service psychiatric unit for children in order to try to get closer to getting an ADHD diagnosis. Great. And I made a comment to the psychiatrist who was meeting with us that the occupational therapist had suggested working on cursive. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, why do that? I mean, he's going to end up just using the computer. I mean, all people really need to be able to do now is sign their names. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) If it's motor skills they're looking for, he can do that with drawing and Lego and Play-Doh and things like that. I mean, I think they want him to have what they call functional handwriting the school. And I mean, I kind of agree. Like, I think it's good to be able to write a note for somebody and have somebody be able to read it. Yeah, I I should work on that. (laughs) (laughs) It was reassuring to have the psychiatrist be like, he doesn't really need that. Yeah, that's good. You don't need one more thing. You need one more thing to fight about. Mm. As we're taping this podcast that my summit hasn't started yet after it's broadcast, it will have already happened. But for you, there's so many interviews that I think you would love. There's one with Debbie Reber on 2E Kids, supporting 2E Mm -hmm. Kids. There's one on advocating for your child at school. This awesome woman who was like so fierce and inspiring. So you should definitely check out those interviews when they come out. And for anyone listening, you should be able to still purchase the recordings on my website. It's funny talking about something that hasn't happened yet as if it's already in the past. But yeah. Mm, yeah, it'll, I thought it's going to be a lot there for you to check out. Mm. And my wife and I, Bigot and I, are going to actually take an online CPS course with Ross Green. Oh, great. I, yeah, it's a Norwegian organization that has Oh, him, cool. That's awesome. Uh, doing, yeah, so I'm excited about that. Cause yeah, that'll be really good. Tried a little bit, but only in a very shallow way. Well, great. I mean, I'm technique. I'm so glad to hear that things are so far going well. I think one thing that you might want to keep in mind is if you can give him breaks from school, like if, you know, there's an afternoon where you could pick him up early or keep him home later in the morning, like if that's something that would work out for your lifestyle, just because it is so much work for him. But I think what you're seeing is is just maturity mm-hmm. from last year to this year, like a big mm-hmm. jump in maturity. Yeah, I think so. And also I think that he really recognizes how much everybody is kind of 
trying to lift him up and support him. I also mm-hmm. think that the cooperation with the new homeroom teacher is helpful. Yes. Yesterday, the reason the teacher called yesterday was to say that like Rowan spat on the floor in front of a teacher. I was like, ooh, okay, I'll talk to him about that, you know. And when I talked to Rowan, I said, which teacher was it? And he said it was the old homeroom oh, teacher. Oh, no. And I just thought, yeah, yeah, okay. Like their relationship just isn't that great. You know, I was like, I understand, but no spitting, (laughs) you know, and I mean, he knows that already. So yeah, yeah, good. Well, I think it sounds like, sounds like things are going well and hopefully they continue. Mm -hmm. Yes, I hope so too. Well, thanks for coming back and giving us the update. Thank you. I think having the strategies and ideas and thoughts about not, you know, not being so anxious about his future and talking to him about, you know, what his intrinsic, trying to encourage his intrinsic motivation to engage is something I've been thinking about. So those have been really helpful. Well, that reminds me of another one of the summit interviews with Ned Johnson about how sometimes the path for kids that are a little bit, well, what we're calling complex kids can be different and just as wonderful. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. I hope you found this conversation insightful and exactly what you needed in this moment. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Remember that I'm rooting for you. I see you out there showing up for your kids and doing the best you can. Sending hugs over the airwaves today. Hang in there. You've got this.